Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's session on philanthropic activism and the climate crisis, building a just, vibrant future for all. I'm Justin Winters, co-founder and executive director of One Earth. Over the course of the next hour, you'll be hearing from a group of dedicated frontline leaders and visionary philanthropists working around the clock and around the world to solve the climate crisis. And we hope today that will be a very different kind of climate conversation. Why? Because we're including the most critical voices that are all too often missing the voices of women, of youth, of indigenous leaders, and people of color. In fact, today, all of our panelists are inspiring female leaders making a significant impact in their communities and to the survival of our planet. But before we hear from them, let me tell you a little bit about One Earth. One Earth is a bold new philanthropic organization that combines science, advocacy, and philanthropy to accelerate on the ground action to stay below 1.5 C. And we truly believe that it's possible to solve the climate crisis. The One Earth Climate Model and a growing body of science shows that we can stay below 1.5 C through three pillars of action, a shift to 100% renewable energy, a transition to regenerative, climate-friendly agriculture, and conservation of the world's land and ocean ecosystems, which absorb half of our carbon emissions every year. Recently, an important scientific paper developed and backed by One Earth was published in Science Advances called the Global Safety Net, which you should be seeing on screen right now. It's the first ever blueprint to restore our biosphere, rebalance the global climate system, and help prevent future pandemics. The two-year research effort finds that 50% of the Earth's land is essential for biodiversity and ecosystem services. And these lands can be woven back together through a network of corridors, restoring 350 mega hectares of degraded land. A full 37% of the global safety net is found within indigenous territories, housing 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. Climate change is a complex global problem. We all know that. However, it will ultimately be solved by action on the ground, on the land where forests thrive, in the neighborhoods where energy is generated, and in the soil where our food is grown. It's clear that frontline communities, in particular indigenous, Afro-descendant, and local communities are vital to protecting nature and solving the climate crisis but their importance has been underestimated for far too long. Right now, we must radically scale support for these groups who are leading the charge on the ground. Let's discuss how to do that today. To tee up our first conversation, we're gonna speak with Leah Thomas. Leah is an intersectional environmental activist and eco-communicator based in Southern California. She's passionate about advocating for and exploring the relationship between social justice and environmentalism and is the founder of the Intersectional Environmentalist Platform. Hi, Leah. Hi, thanks so much for having <laughs> me. Welcome, it's, it's great to have you with us today. Um, first off, um, can you explain what intersectional environmentalism is and why you are focused on that approach? Absolutely. Um, so there are a lot of diverse voices around the world that aren't always a focus, but they might actually be key to solving the climate crisis. And by not having a diverse climate movement, we're missing out on all of these different diverse voices and ideas that could be extremely helpful in our fight to save our home planet. And while I was an environmental science and policy student, I started to learn more about environmental justice. And I came across the fact that many environmental scientists talk about the what of climate change and not always the who. So scientists will talk about toxic waste sites or endangered salmon, but they don't always talk about the other pieces of information like the communities that surround the toxic waste sites or rely on the endangered salmon. And when we look at the data around those types of communities that are often impacted, what we see is that black and brown and low income communities are almost always disproportionately impacted. And then even when we take that and look internationally, for example, at island and ocean communities, scientists and people in general talk about sea level rise, but they don't talk about who suffers the most as a result with their cultural values and things like that. Um, that would be worsened. Um, so with intersectional environmentalism, I wanna ask more about the who of the climate crisis and bring attention to those most affected by climate change and not just focus on the what. Mm -hmm. It's such a good point, the who and the what. 
Um, they need to be woven together. Um, could you share a little bit about what scares you about climate change? What motivates you in this in this crisis, in this battle, and what's missing from the climate conversation? Absolutely. I think what scares me the most, it scares me a lot that if the climate crisis is not addressed, the people that we mentioned earlier, the communities of color and low income communities will continue to face the biggest threats of the climate crisis. So that kind of scares me and I hope that that's addressed. But what gives me a tremendous amount of hope is that the community that Intersectional Environmentalist has built. Um, we have over 100,000 people that are mostly aged 18 to 24, and those are voting age individuals that believe in intersectional environmentalism and wanna create real change and make a more diverse climate movement. So that gives me a ton, a ton of hope. Um, and one thing that I think is missing from the climate conversation that I would love to be addressed a bit more is amplification and how we as an environmental community can continue to amplify the efforts of diverse climate activists, not as saviors per se, but asking the question, how can I amplify the voices and efforts of the people that are already there and doing the work and not necessarily um, like how I can save these communities? That's such a good point. I mean, those communities are really um, they're really key in actually solving the climate crisis, as long as they're supported and given um, and supported with resources and supported um, by having their voices amplified. Absolutely. And I've been reading a lot about One Earth and reading into everything your team is doing to help the Earth stay below the dangerous 1.5 um, see in global temperature rise. And something that I love about One Earth is that I walk away from your resources with a sense of optimism. And a lot of climate organizations and websites are scary, you know, as they should be because the information is a little scary. But I love that One Earth presents it in a way that's accessible and approachable. And I walk away not necessarily feeling doom and gloom, but hope for the future. Um, so, Justin, what, what gives you hope? I mean, I mean, it's great to hear that you feel that way. Um, you know, that was really the intention of, of One Earth. Um, it was part of a, a real journey of questioning um, and trying to problem solve and not just problem solve within a small team of, of people working at One Earth, but um, actually with a network of people around the world that are doing incredible work, whether it's in science or, you know, with um, frontline communities. Um, so we asked ourselves several years ago, you know, is it possible to solve climate change? Um, we were hearing endless, you know, endless news accounts that climate change was here and it was real and it was escalating, um, but not really having any clarity about what could be done. Um, so we started working with a whole network of leading scientists, climate scientists, biodiversity scientists, and and asking these questions and asking for scientific answers. You know, is it possible to solve climate change? So. Um, after two years of, of research, the One Earth Climate Model that was led by University of Technology Sydney um, was published in 2019. It's a 500-page book, so it's you know pretty pretty dense work there. <laughs> um, but essentially, in short, it answers that question. It says that it is possible to solve climate change. It's possible for us um, as a society, human society, to achieve a world of less than 1.5 C if we move rapidly into transforming how we live on the planet. And it underpins, along with other science that we ended up funding and working with scientists on, um, essentially three solution pathways, um, which I mentioned before, but the transition in our energy systems to 100% renewable energy, protecting and restoring 50% of our world's lands and oceans, um, and shifting how we grow food to regenerative climate-friendly agriculture. So that was kind of the, you know, the big first question we had asked. Um, and obviously it was very dense, complex science to get the answer. But the short answer is yes, we have the solutions today. We can solve the climate crisis. Um, and obviously we just, we want to share that with the world so that people don't feel disempowered about tackling this crisis, but feel empowered to be part of building a vibrant, just world going forward. And that requires all people. Um, and it requires, you know, respecting and honoring Earth. Um, so the other piece that I already referenced before was the global safety net, and that is essentially the roadmap that shows that it's 
you know, what is what is the roadmap of nature that needs to be protected and restored in the context of solving climate change and protecting biodiversity and supporting people? Um, and so that's why we did the global safety net work with many partners and leading scientists and the partnership with Google Earth. Um, so all of that is, you know, our, our one of our missions at One Earth is to make that science accessible and actionable so that it empowers the whole network, the whole climate movement into action. Um, the second piece, which really, you know, leads into the most interesting part of the conversation, which you already spoke to, is um, I was, you know, I've I've worked in the climate movement and from a very you know, special position of being able to drive philanthropic resources to the, to the network of change makers on the ground. And when you have access to that movement, that movement of thousands, if not millions of leaders and communities and incredible people driving change on the ground, despite ridiculous adversity and um, obstacles that are in their path, it is very empowering and inspiring and it makes you, you're directly connected to hope that is about collective change and collective action. It's not about any one of us. No one person is a savior. It is really about us working together collectively. And that gives me, you know, that is motivating because it's, and so I'm here, you know, to be in service to that network of change makers. And, um, and that's frankly why I'm excited you know, to have the panel that we have coming up next and really grateful to the conversation with you um, and for your for your clarity and your passion and your commitment to protecting planet and people. So Leah, thank you for joining us and sharing your wisdom. Thank you so much for having me. And now we're gonna move to the main panel. Welcome. Um, I am so thrilled to have this group of women here with us today. Um, I feel really fortunate and lucky that everybody could carve out time of their, from their busy schedules to join us um, from many different locations around the world. So we're going to jump straight in and I'll do a, um, a quick introduction of each panelist and then we're going to jump straight into the first question. Um, first off, we have Melina Lubakan Massimo. She's the program director at Indigenous Climate Action the founder of Sacred Earth Solar and a fellow at the David Suzuki Foundation. Her work and research are focused on the areas of climate change, indigenous knowledge and renewable energy. Then we have with us Tabara Enjay, who is a program officer for the American Jewish World Service, where she's responsible for Senegal and Democratic Republic of Congo. She's also an advisor for the Agroecology Fund. We also have with us Namonte Nenkimo, who is a Warani leader and co-founder of the Sabo Alliance, an indigenous-led nonprofit organization which was formed in 2015 to protect indigenous lands and livelihoods from resource extraction within their territories. We actually have big news this week um, for Namote and the Sabo Alliance, as Namote has been included recently in the recently announced 2020 time list of the 100 most influential people on the planet. Congratulations, Namote, and to your community. Um, and we all have another announcement. The Sabo Alliance is um, receiving the prestigious UN Equator Prize. So it's a big, a big week of acknowledgement for their incredible work. Um, and finally, we have Zainab Salbi, who is a co-founder of Daughters of Earth and the founder and former CEO of Women for Women International, a global nonprofit directly supporting 420,000 women survivors of wars and rebuilding their lives. Um, so we thought we would jump right in with some storytelling so that um, the audience today can hear these vibrant, powerful stories of these women leaders and what they've been involved in and, and working on. Um, so I'd love to hear from each of you about the climate work that you've been involved in at the community level and really explain for the audience, you know, what is frontline climate action? What does it look like? What's been your experience? Um, and Melina, it'd be great to start with you. Tense Guakia, thank you, Justin. Nia Melina Miawap and Lobokan Masamo and Nia Nihia Kineskuntanawa. My name is Melina Lobokan Masamo. I am Lubokan Cree from Northern Alberta, Canada, and so called Canada. I am um, from a small indigenous community that is in the heart of the tar sands. 
I was actually born into the community that's art that was already fighting in the early 80s um, to protect Mother Earth and land dispossession. Actually, my first my first blockade was at the age of seven when my community was blocking a newly built road that brought with it deforestation, oil and gas and logging and extraction. So from this time till now, I never thought that I would see such immense devastation to our homelands. Um, I went on the horse and wagon with my Cucamimus and my grandparents and we saw beautiful, pristine, northern ancient boreal forest, which is the northern lungs of Mother Earth. And now we have become number one in deforestation across the world in Canada in 2014. So things have drastically changed from when I was a child. So as a young woman, I decided I needed to speak out and dedicate my life to this um, speaking out against destruction and protection of our land and our peoples. So I started to organize teach-in protest gatherings, speaking tours, media tours, investors tours to bring awareness to what was happening in our homelands and raise the alarm bell on the tar sands. So I did this for over 15 years and organized around social, environmental and climate issues. Then there was a massive oil spill in my home community. It was one of the biggest oil spills in Alberta and Canada's history and my family couldn't breathe, their eyes were burning, their stomachs were turning. It's actually why I testified before US Congress in 2012 because of seeing oil spills like this and testified against the KXL and the building of that. And the question that came to me repeatedly after this spill was, how do I build the future that I wanna see? So after years of campaigning against the destruction of our homelands, I started to build climate solutions. I started to build the yes to our no's. And so in 20, 2013, I started to fundraise and research and bring solar to our home community. And by 2015, my home in my home community, I built a 20.8 kilowatt system that powers our health center. It's one of the first indigenous led and community owned solar projects in the heart of the tar sands. We trained young people to implement the project and we started doing energy and climate li energy literacy workshops in where none were actually um, available before that. From there, I created an organization called Sacred Earth Solar, which actually helps build solar projects in indigenous communities across Turtle Island, especially for indigenous women that are standing on the front lines blocking destructive fossil fuel projects. Um, and that's why that's what Sacred Earth Solar became. And we've also fun, uh, we also started um, Indigenous Climate Action, which I'll talk a little bit more about um, from this and just finished actually launching a TV show that profiles renewable energy from indigenous communities from coast to coast in, and it's airing right now in Canada. It's called Power to the People. So these are the stories that of the future that I wanna see, the future that is here, the future that is now, the future that communities are building already towards recovery, resiliency and preparedness. And many of them are led by indigenous peoples and be, can be seen in the stories of Power to the People. Because not only are Indigenous peoples on the front line of environmental degradation, land protection and climate change, but we are also on the front lines of climate solutions. So we need to uplift more of these climate victories and we need to see more of them in the world and see the support for the, these types of projects. So hi, hi, thank you for including me in this panel. Thank you, Melina. That was wonderful. Um, we're going to move on to Namonte Nenkimo. No. Buenas, buenas tardes, buenas tardes y ella no sé qué hora es. Eh, gracias por dar esa oportunidad y estar con las mujeres muy poderosa y eso me hace sentir fuerza y también a Justina de dar oportunidad. Eh, yo soy mujer guaurani, eh, soy de comunidad guaurani de Pastaza. He estado yo eh, luchando también, he visto mucho de las... Eh, me gusta contar la historia de donde vengo. Yo soy una mujer guau, wow, mis padres, mis abuelos siempre los voy a colaborar y luchar en su territorio. Porque en territorio nos da toda la vida, nos da el aire, nos da el agua, todo. Y también esa lucha no es solamente pueblo indígena, sino al mundo entero que vivimos. Por eso es la lucha. Eh, también me gustaría decir la historia que últimamente nosotros que hemos hecho una lucha muy fuerte a pensar que hemos visto otras nacionalidades que viven el primer contacto occidental con el petróleo. Eh, muchas de las veces en el mundo occidental piensa que el petróleo va a dar la solución de educación, salud, pero para mi vista como mujer guau wow, que he ido a ver a mis hermanos eh, Cofanes, Sionas, eh, otras nacionalidades, que solo ha traído destrucción, solo ha traído eh, contaminación y la muerte. 
por eso como mujer yo he, he dado un coraje para poder luchar y hemos hecho últimamente la historia, que hemos hecho un, el gobierno ecuatoriano nos que, quiso vender nuestro territorio sin dar permiso, sin respeto a nuestro territorio. Y por eso nosotros hemos unido y hemos enfrentado y hemos ganado. Esa victoria no solamente para el pueblo guaraní, sino esa victoria es también otro, para otras nacionalidades que viven en ese planeta. Y esa victoria también es muy importante que el gobierno ecuatoriano debe respetar nuestro territorio. Muchas de las veces nuestro territorio no hemos sido como respetadas. Siempre ven nuestro territorio, la, nuestro derecho, violan nuestra vivencia, nuestra vida. Siempre ha venido como un montón de las cosas destruyendo. Y eso como mujer me ha nacido de, de tener coraje, de tener luchar, porque es muy importante nuestro territorio nos da vida para nuestros hijos, para vuestros hijos que estamos viviendo en el mundo. Thank you so much, Nemo. Um, that was really a powerful story to share. Um, Tabara, um, I was going to ask you to share more about your work in agroecology and regenerative agriculture and the communities that you've worked with. Okay, thank you, uh, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me tonight. It's a very powerful panel. And uh, my name is Tabarenjai. I am uh, Senegalese uh, based in Senegal. And uh, I am from a rural community in the southern part of Senegal. And in my community, uh, women uh, play a very important role, a very central role in food production. And uh, I grew up seeing my mother, my grandmother producing food, more importantly, rice. And it's the duty of the woman, of the real of the woman to feed the family with her food production like rice millet and everything and uh, i went to school outside my re native region and uh, i was at the university in dakar the main the capital city and when i came back into my community i have seen that a lot of women were losing their leadership in the area of food production And I start working into the communities with women groups really to help them uh, regain this, uh, the, the confidence they had before, the leadership they had before. And the main obstacle was that they were not able anymore to produce food for their families. So if they are not able to do that, they can't even gain respect and honor into the household and into their families. And I started in 2005 working with foundations, US-based foundations, really to support rural women organizations. And in 2011, we've started, we've launched uh, uh, a campaign called the We Are the Solution. Uh, it's the voice of women, rural women saying that they have noticed that they are the solution of the food climate. And it started, it was a pan-African, Uh, feminist move to um, uh, climate justice. And uh, it started in five West African countries. It's active in 15 countries in Africa. And the objective of the campaign was to help national organizations to work in the level of the countries uh, to influence the development of, uh, of, uh, of uh, agricultural policies that will involve agroecological practices because they think that agroecology um, is a way that their grandmothers were producing food. So it's important that the mm -hmm. government supports efforts and inputs, subsidize agroecological inputs. So this is what we were doing. And we were able also to work with national platforms like in Senegal to uh, do a research with the universities and the rural women organization to make sure that there is a transition to agroecology. So we have now in all these 15 countries, uh, projects that are supporting communities to have a, to do a, a transition to agroecology. Because we think that agroecology is a way to go. It involves um, leadership for women. It involves a lot of uh, uh, partnership, uh, protection for earth, and also for soil and water and it gives women a lot of space in terms of really deciding on how they want their families and communities to be to be fit. So this is the way I am doing my activism because I think that we 
supporting the work of food production, agroecology, it is important also to be at the table of uh, uh, philanthropies uh, where resources are decided uh, to be to be shared. So that's why this is what I am doing. And I'm also at the agroecological, uh, at the agroecology fund as an advisor. And it's a big fund. And uh, we are supporting collaboratives that really make the voice of women and their organizations heard when it comes to develop, uh, developing uh, food policies for agriculture and so on. So this is what I'm doing. Thanks. Thank you, Tara. Um, and Zainab, finally with you, um, you're coming at this from a slightly different perspective, um, but tell us about your, your journey and your experience and the power of supporting women-led grassroots efforts. And I know you also have a, an, an announcement to share as well. I do. Well, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be in, in the company of amazing women. And um, in honoring of everyone sharing their story, I'll share a little bit my, about my story. I am um, from Iraq. I was born and raised in here, uh, there. Although today I'm not speaking as an Iraqi. Uh, today I'm speaking as an American and maybe a global citizen as well. Um, and, and basically what I'm speaking about is my experience in starting a group called Women for Women International, which is a grassroots women's organization that was started about 27 years ago. Um, and it's all about the power of women who are not only making solutions, but also in raising lots of amount of um, resources and money to support other women. So I, I came as a witness that hmm, women have a lot of power actually uh, when mobilized. And um, after a few decades of uh, running Women for Women International, a few years ago, um, friends of mine, um, we got together in a conservation land and we were talking about how do we mobilize women on climate change issues and uh, that women were missing from the discussion, at least at the larger level. And we started doing studies and uh, saying what's going on, why are... Uh, uh, now we have, of course, now we hear more women's voices. That was about three years ago, which was how do we mobilize women? And what we discovered that always the truth, right, is like there is women there doing it, working hard as on sustainable solutions, but their voices were not represented accurately. Our research showed that actually 36% of women, uh, well, women are 36% more likely to care about climate change and solutions than men, but that the language they use the expressions of how do they implement that um, is different than only policies. It's much more on a personal level. It also has compassion in it. It has sustainability in it. Um, and as a result, a uh, few friends and myself, um, our amazing colleagues and myself, we founded uh, Daughters of Earth, which is a campaign that um, uh, we have the privilege and we're very excited to be partnering with One Earth on that, um, that aims at asking women to do one thing, one of the three things that One Earth science uh, research identified, which is in earth preservation. Historically, women are known uh, as, um, as you know, doing the majority of farming in the world, but we we are the minority in uh, in owning land in the world. Um, the statistics goes for anywhere from 2% to 10 to 20% maximum of farming land owned by women. So we're trying to reverse the process actually of having women be custodian of land for not only farming it, actually for to be preser preserving it. And we're doing that through local communities led initiatives on the ground in different parts of the world and in partnerships with One Earth. And on that, I want to share with you a video because we're just launching Daughters of Earth and replicating what I've learned from Women for Women International, the power of every woman in the world, regardless of her resources, to be a philanthropist and to be an agent of change. And I think we can do it. If the scientists are saying we can, we need to preserve 50% of Earth to give Earth a break to regenerate itself, then I think women can take the lead in this initiative. I believe that I have witnessed the women's impact and I am um, excited to be launching Daughters of Earth. And I, on this note, I wanna uh, share the video with you.
thank you so much, Zainab. That was powerful um, and excited to be part of that, that campaign and to empower women all over the world to be part of this movement. Um, moving into some questions, I wanted to ask Melina and Namonte specifically, um, why is getting philanthropic resources in direct support of indigenous-led actions so critical at this particular moment? Well, Justin, supporting indigenous leadership in the climate movement is essential to ensuring indigenous values and worldviews are heard, especially within emerging strategies for climate solutions. Indigenous peoples have thrived as caretakers for Mother Earth, and over 80% of our, the world's biodiversity is under the protection of our lands and territories, which means our rights, our cultures, and our lifeways are critical to developing pathways for climate stability and creating healthy and, and maintaining healthy lands, waters, and and air for the future. So by putting indigenous values, rights, and sovereignty at the center of climate conversations, we are changing the great, we are changing the game for climate solutions, indigenous settler relationships, and for the future of all on Mother Earth. So I think it's important to support indigenous peoples on the front lines because we are actually the ones that are constantly putting our bodies on the front lines. And we need, and we are actually stalling and stopping destructive fossil fuel projects, which actually abates the climate change crisis. So we actually really need to support more communities on the front lines that are doing this critical work of putting of, of stopping sacrifice zones by actually sacrificing their own bodies. And so this is so important why we need to see more philanthropic resources directed in, in direct support of indigenous led action. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Melina. Um, Nemo, I'd love to hear, hear your thoughts on this. Bueno, esa pregunta es muy, muy clara, es, es que me, me emociona de responder, ¿no? Y nosotros como pueblo guaraní siempre hemos estado luchando, enfrentando nuestra vida, eh, nuestra selva, cuidando y también para el planeta. Y también nosotros también, digamos, como este recurso nos va a ayudar muchísimo porque eh, es como para movilizar, para tener estrategia, para jugar con el abogados, ayudar con los abogados y también hacer asamblea en nuestro territorio. Eso se necesita para seguir luchando porque nosotros, donde nosotros vivimos, estamos entregando nuestra vida para defender ese planeta, para defender que todo el mundo vivimos. Por eso es muy importante. Hoy en día necesitamos recursos para poder luchar y enfrentar porque Yo lo que veo es que el gobierno, capitalismo, tiene mucho dinero, muchísimo dinero y quieren seguir sacando nuestros recursos para seguir destruyendo nuestra vida, ¿no? Y, y por eso es como, es necesario ahora que, que nos apoye económicamente para nosotros seguir luchando, para nosotros seguir viviendo, porque nosotros en nuestra Amazonía estamos viviendo, a mano a mano estamos luchando, a mano a mano estamos enfrentando y viviendo en la selva y, y los extractivistas vienen a, a destruir. Eso es como difícil sin economía salir a ciudad, jugar con papel, hacer estratégica y seguir defendiendo. Namonte, thank you for sharing that. Um, it makes it really clear why philanthropic resources are so important to sustaining movement building and action on the ground. Um, and it's a powerful call to action for people to, to answer. Um, as I mentioned earlier, shockingly less than 0.2% of all philanthropic funding goes to women-led environmental action. If we were able to flip that statistic and direct significant resources and support to women-led climate and environmental efforts on the ground, how would that change things? What makes women-led efforts a unique and powerful opportunity to drive change? Zainab and Tabara, um, maybe Tabara, do you want to jump in here first? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Justin, I, I'm convinced that women-led efforts are important to change into uh, the environmental um, crisis because women are the key actors of environmental activities. Um, I have the experience in rural Africa where women are the one doing a lot of farming activities, producing food. And they have the power, really, women, women have the power to, through spirituality, through the lessons they have learned from their ancestors, to support and uh, to uh, learn the lessons, but also to pass on the lesson learned to the next generation. 
and they have the power to day day to day practice what they have learned into into uh, the, the uh, uh, environmental activities. And we have also seen that women organ women led activities are uh, central and the, to the to the community to the change at the level of your communities because um, uh, if we look at the community, women are the one who can take a lesson, take a knowledge and get share it, share it with uh, the other members of the community. And we, when we invest in women, when I have what I have learned also uh, through my philanthropist life is that uh, it's a long term investment. They don't travel, they are into the communities and they are able to work long term into the uh, solutions and uh, learn the lessons and pass on the um, lessons they have learned to the next generations. So it's uh, about knowledge sharing, it's about the way they, pre they preserve seed, the way they preserve water and land. Mm -hmm. And these are all reasons for us to support, continue support and investing in women-led initiatives. Thank you. Thanks, Tamara. Um, Zainab? Yeah, I mean, we're talking about funding in here and there are two levels in here. One is funding for all women projects of any kind is women get to 20 cents out of every dollar in philanthropic dollar. And when it comes to, you know, um, particularly the climate change movement is, as you mentioned, it's a 2%, which is incredibly little. And I think there are few reasons for that. You know, um, when it comes to women, there is, we are living in a masculine world and, and the, a lot of more resources are with men and it is what it is, right? That's part of the reason, not it is what it is, it's part of the reason why we're getting so little funding. The second thing is that there's bias. And the bias is not only about women, but about community-led uh, activities. Um, often community-led activities or local organizations on the ground don't have the ability to do perhaps stats or PowerPoints, or they don't have the access to attend conferences in the Western world. And maybe they don't even have the fluency in the language to present. And there is no tolerance, to be honest, in, in, in presenting ideas and sustainable, tangible solutions in ways that are different than what we have been taught, that this is how you go about getting funding and what you do in networking and da 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 So partially, um, there's access, but partially the philanthropic community also has to reflect on itself and how it can make um funding not only focus on the larger NGOs, which has gotten a lot of funds for decades now, but really focus on what, you know, records and records and studies and studies, the future and the future is community led initiatives, community led solutions. Um, so it's, it takes reflections on all. And I wanna, two last point. One is that is why we're launching Daughters of Earth. It is actually to make sure that we mobilize women at the grassroots level to find a very simple way of actions. We're asking, you know, part of land preservations, we're giving $10 for 10 meters of land, and that money goes directly to community-led organizations that we're identifying and vetting. And so we're giving that opportunity for women to engage directly. The second part, actually, Justin, is I want to send back the question to you because you also have experience and um, you found some research. I'm, I'm curious if you actually have perspective on that. Why are we getting such little amount of funding and what would it need to be it? Um, you know, I would say it, it has always blown me away that environment and climate issues get less than 2% of all philanthropic dollars. Uh, and most of those those philanthropic resources have actually gone to top-down strategies to shift policy, to reform industry, or to jumpstart carbon markets. Um, as you mentioned, uh, just a fraction of those actually reach on the ground action and solutions. Um, and I, I, you know, at One Earth and, and from a personal perspective, I think there's a huge opportunity for scaling up philanthropic capital and getting it to communities and leaders and organizations on the ground that are basically implementing the transformation that we need today. Um, I'm gonna move right on to the next question. Um, it's been well documented that 
and many of you have experienced firsthand the trauma and the adversity of being on the front lines of the climate crisis. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to hear, um, you know, what sustains your commitment to this work and to the broader mission of solving the climate crisis and, and what gives you hope despite the adversity and the trauma that you've been through? Um, and it would be great specifically to hear from um, Melina and Namonte on this, but others can jump in, of course, too. Melina, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah, trauma is real in our communities. Uh, we are living the detriment and impacts of a colonial um, a colonial agenda um, that has lasted for 500 years. So it's it's a very um, hard thing to return to recover from. So we're dealing in indigenous communities tr the trauma of forced relocation, land dis dispossession, um, destruction um, of our our very ways of living and our culture and our languages, and who we are as indigenous peoples, and and this actually breaks down our ability to protect the land when, you know, the land is, is our church. And when you destroy the land, you destroy us as people. And so it's, it's very traumatic. It's very traumatizing. And for me, what keeps me going is working in solidarity with other indigenous communities and working in, in allyship with non-indigenous peoples. And I feel like all people right now are included and needed right now in the to address the climate crisis. And I feel like not enough people are standing up and standing in solidarity with indigenous peoples on the front lines that are literally, um, as Nemote said, and have, as I've experienced, is like on the back of our of our people. We are we are dealing with the burden of trauma, and we are dealing with the burden of environmental degradation. And so, I think for me, it's it's the hope is that more people are starting to wake up. The hope is that our future generations will continue to take up this work, and they're facing horrible a horrible future. I mean, I'm looking outside right now, and it's it is white and blurred from the fires. You know, we can't breathe right now. Um, so we need to address all levels of systemic racism to ensure that our people, um, black, brown and indigenous bodies can do this work and work in allyship. And that's why we need decolonization. So decolonization is what gives me hope of unlearning the patriarchal and colonial values that have really brought us into a climate crisis. And indigenous peoples um, are poised to actually bring about and bring back these teachings that have actually let us live in, in, in harmony with Mother Earth from time immemorial. So thank you. Thank you, Melina. Um, Namonte, we would love to hear your, your perspective on this. You know, what sustains you despite the adversity and the trauma that you and your communities have faced and what gives you hope? Bueno, esta parte para mí es como pueblos guauranis, nosotros como recién hace contacto hace 50 años atrás, de ver eso cuando vemos como que los colonialismo, la gente capitalismo se han entrado a nuestro territorio a destruir y sin respeto, matándose nuestra vida, nuestro agua, contaminando con nuestros animales, todo el ambiente, eso nos da coraje, nos da rabia, ganas de seguir luchando. Como yo, mi, como mujer guaraní joven, madre, eh, no tengo miedo, no tolero de ese miedo. Yo quiero seguir luchando, yo quiero seguir uniendo a los demás mujeres como ustedes están, mujeres fuertísimas que tienen experiencia, experiencia como nosotros en primer sufrimiento. Más bien, yo diría que hay que unir las mujeres, hay que despertar a los demás gente del mundo que están ciegos. Nosotros como indígenas vivimos, tenemos conocimiento, tenemos espiritual, vivimos junto con la naturaleza, sabemos la destrucción que se puede causar cambio climático y hemos venido luchando miles por miles de años. Y los que son gente de, de desarrollo país que dice que son científicos, solo han venido destruyendo, solo han venido contaminando. Ahora ellos están, la gente que son expertos, dice, están matando en donde tierra madre. La tierra madre necesita respeto. Por eso es más importante hoy en día, que es una gran amenaza global. Por eso es despertarnos, juntarnos tanto, no solamente esperar a escuchar voces de los indígenas, sino las mujeres que estamos escuchando, eh, unir y trabajar y, y eh, construir nuestro planeta para el futuro generaciones. Senado. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, I want to take a moment. Um, you know, I grew up in Iraq as a Muslim, and uh, what keeps me uh, gives me hope is the way I grew up. My mother used to say, "Never look at God and think God is up there. God is in the trees, and in the sand, and in the grass, and everything around us." And often in my life, very personal, when I got sick and when I am in despair, I go to nature to heal me. And um, out of my love for what my mother taught me about where to see God, um, and out of my personal witnessing the healing of nature, the fight now is personal. This is not a concept about climate change. It's personal. So what keeps me personal going and I think keeps a lot of women going it is knowing that we this is about our survival this is about our souls our love our children um, and that is like a, it's a motivation of not only um, frustration it's a motivation of love um, it's, it's part of breathing um, and I think that's um, what's driving a lot of me a lot me and a lot of women around as well thanks and uh yeah. That was, um, yeah. oh, Tabara, did you want to jump in? Yeah. Yeah, just to um, share also that uh, what gives me hope and what makes me really every day wake up and do this work is that I have seen communities where um, supporting a group of women has changed the whole history of the community with very uh, an adoption of sustainable agriculture but also with a very um, active philanthropy, we have supported a uh, woman organization, grassroots, very local rural women organizations get the funds and the resources, the skills really to advocate for um, agricultural lands to be owned by women individually, but also collectively. And having seen that and having seen the whole community recognize that the solution is in the hands of women. It is something very, very powerful. And I think that I have seen women gain more leadership, more power into their household, but also into the whole community. So this is something very important to me that makes me really feel that this is the way, this is the way to go. Thanks. Um, these were really powerful answers. So I really just thank you for sharing uh, so honestly. Um, no, I, I'm no doubt that those those wisdom, those pieces of wisdom, and those um, stories will stick with everybody. I think for a long time. Um, just as a final question, I, I wanted to give everybody a chance um, to really share with the audience, you know, and um, say how can you know answer the question: How can those listening here today better support you, your work, your community, um, and climate action more? broadly and feel free to throw out a challenge because clearly it's time for everybody to step up in much bolder, more accountable ways. And frankly, um, the opportunity to collectively be part of the solution and um, the transformation that has to occur for us to create a vibrant future is a powerful opportunity too. Um, so I just, I'm gonna throw it out to you guys, whoever wants to, to jump in first um, with a, a call to action um, and an invitation for this this audience to support you and support this incredible work. We all uh, play a role. I think that we all have a role to play as a philanthropist, as a um, policymaker, as a consumer. Uh, and uh, for me, the big support here. We are asking people to to uh, a big commitment is really to continue supporting grassroots led. Uh, efforts. And uh, when I say that in rural Africa, supporting the initi initiatives um, towards um, climate change is really supporting women organizations at all levels. Investing in women is making sure that the solution will be um, uh, applicable, but also that uh, food production, everything that we protect, uh, land, water, and the, uh, the air will be implemented. So at all levels, whatever you can do, it's important that you are part of the process and you support um, local-led uh, uh, organizations and initiatives. And that's very, very important because the investments in local-led initiatives are not important because they don't have these very sophisticated um, skills 
to write reports, really to apply for grants and so on. So we have to be militant activists at some point so that we can support these uh, long-lasting initiatives and de uh, defend the uh, right of communities at all levels. That's what I wanted to share. Thank you, Tabara. Um, Nemo, could you share your perspective on this? Yeah. Bueno, me gustaría dar mensaje que están escuchando este línea este muy importante. Creo que están escuchando en todas partes. Primeramente me gustaría decir a la gente de sociedad mundo occidental, capitalismo deben cambiarse. ¿Por qué le digo eso? Porque ellos destruyen nuestro territorio. Nosotros como pueblo bogorani por el pueblo bogorani y tantos indígenas nunca hemos contaminado, nunca hemos destruido nuestra naturaleza, nunca hemos ensuciado el agua, nunca hemos eh, traído la enfermedad que le mata. Por eso yo pido que están escuchando, ellos tienen que también apoyar recursos, invertir este recurso que nosotros como pueblo bogorani vivimos en la selva, tenemos contacto con la naturaleza, con lo espiritual, con la vida. De, de todo armonía y no estamos nosotros destruyendo, estamos protegiendo. Por eso ellos tienen que dar ese recurso, invertir de las organizaciones comunitarias directamente. Muchas de las veces en el mundo se asustan de cambio climático, hacen conferencias, donan eh, donaciones grandes, eh, eh, dinero, pero nunca llega a la comunidad, solamente protestan en las ciudades nomás. Y nosotros nos cuesta mucho que estamos entregando nuestra vida para salvar, para dar la vida a la planeta. Y por eso pediría que todos que están escuchando, mejor es aliarse, mejor es despertar, mejor es escuchar nuestras voces para uh, tener una alianza colectiva, trabajar junto con nosotros como pueblos indígenas y las las organizaciones cercanas que están trabajando también uh, directamente a la comunidad, aliarse, eh, ponerse en contacto, difundir ese mensaje, eso sería mejor manera para, para construir, cuidar nuestro planeta. Si nosotros esto estamos escuchando, no podemos a, a aliarse, no podemos a preocuparse, no estamos dejando nada para futuro en generaciones para nuestros hijos. Yo daría ese mensaje de todo corazón porque estamos en la vida que estamos sentando en el mundo capitalismo, no está respetando la tierra, tierra madre. La tierra madre no está, los mundos occidentales no necesita tierra madre que salme, sino que respete. Eso yo daría el mensaje. Thank you, Namonte. Um, Zainab. It's a quick uh, request. Um, everyone, I ask uh, to go to Daughters of Earth uh, if you want to be part of uh, Earth Preservation and um, your money will go directly to community-led, women-led uh, initiatives for Earth Preservations from different parts of the world in partnership with One Earth. So um, $10, 10 meters, or if you are part of land preservation, please let us know because we want to track all the land that women are taking the lead in preserving it. So simple, um, daughtersofearth.org. Thank you, Zanab. We would love to hear from Melina now. Thank you, Justin. Please go to sacredearth.solar and indigenous climate action and find ways to support how indigenous peoples are addressing the climate crisis. It is critical to support indigenous led organizations that are on the ground like Sacred Earth and Indigenous Climate Action because these communities are directly interfacing and connecting with communities that are on the front lines and bringing about climate solutions. It's critical that our voices are heard, that we tell our own stories and stories that have been silenced for too long, stories that will actually help to heal the world and teach others how to live in communion with Mother Earth and bring about solutions that we need to see. So I ask the people that are listening today, please, when you're looking around a room and seeing who is representative, this is to the philanthropic community, and if somebody that isn't, if there's no indigenous peoples in the room, what are you going to do about it? It's so important that we need to see more funders from the philanthropic community to be actively looking who they can support on the ground as opposed to the other way around. So thank you. Melina, thank you. Um, it's just been an honor to talk to all of you. And um, 
my only wish is that we could have been together for this conversation. <laughs> um, but I'm grateful to have have had it and for, for others to have access to this as well. Um, one thing that I wanted to share is just an announcement from One Earth about something that we'll be launching today. Um, and that is that, you know, as part of One Earth's commitment to rapidly scaling philanthropic capital for on the ground climate solutions, like those that you've heard about today, we're excited to announce the launch of the One Earth Project Marketplace. Um, organized by a new biogeographical framework, Bioregions 2020, the marketplace will allow individuals to find and fund projects on the ground that are having a major impact in the, collecti in the collective effort to transition communities to 100% renewable energy, protect and restore the global safety net of nature that is essential for our future, and to shift the food we grow, how we grow our food through regenerative agriculture practices that heal the soil and nourish communities. All of these efforts together are helping to realize the goal of staying below 1.5 degrees Celsius in global temperature rise by building a vibrant, resilient future for both people and for planet. You can check out the beta version of the marketplace by visiting oneearth.org, where you can learn about your bioregion, find impactful projects, and nominate new projects to be considered in a more expanded version of the marketplace that we'll be launching next year. Um, and again, just wanted to wrap up this incredible panel, um, thanking these women for being here with us um, and sharing their voices, their time. I know time is precious. So, um, and everybody's dialing in from different parts of, of the earth. Um, and to me, it's the, it, it is women like you and thousands, if not millions of other women like you around the world that are doing this work that give me great hope that we can solve climate change we can be part of a collective action movement um, to rebuild how we live here. And it can, in fact, be a much more beautiful, just and resilient world. Um, and I want to be part of that with you. And I think um, hopefully we're inspiring people to, to join in. So thank you.